basically premiered it at South by Southwest Eco um, in October. And now this is really the beginning of a tour we're going to do with the film, and it's meant to sort of leverage the model that's in the film, like in a sense, to show the work of building a you know a sustainable agroforestry program in Haiti as a, as a model potentially for smallholder farmers like across the world. So anyway, happy to answer questions about the filmmaking process, about the model itself, about the characters, anything you guys might have. Go ahead. Thanks so much. Sure. I just I I wanted there were two connections. I just want to see if you can say a little more about that. Like, you can quite see, but I'm sure they're there. Mm -hmm. What's the connection between the, the project of planting trees and the food production? So there was there was the, the two people we followed, um, uh, you and Timo, um, you know, seemed to be concerned about the tree portion, but then the, 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 the farmer asking about onions and peppers. Mm -hmm. So so the, I think the connection between the trees and the food production. And then, Connection between the large scale production, they're surveying the huge area of land that plant 200,000 trees, and then the small, small plot farming. Um, <clears throat> yes, and you're talking about the lime operation specifically. If you want to just like quickly repeat the question, maybe yeah. for the live for that. So there's two questions really. One is the connection. How, how does it connect between the, the tree operation and the agricultural crops operation? For the farmer specifically, and then with the lime operation, which we which we follow, um, how is that huge plot of land that you look at connect then to the smallholder farmers? Um, so let me handle the second one, and then maybe you can answer sure. the question. Um, so the basic model for the lime operation is to it has kind of multi parts. They have they have one big plantation as you saw that they've set up um, that's going to be cooperatively farmed. And then they have additionally lime disbursement that they're doing to two different types of farmer plots so that people who have kind of like uh, just want a few trees on, uh, on their homestead, they will have a number of trees like that. And then some other farmers that have more space to plant um, will have additional. Hugh would be able to tell you the exact numbers, but it's basically kind of three different um, divisions of lime operation. And um, lime, unlike moringa, takes a really you know a few years before the fruit is it bears fruit. Um, so in a sense, like they've got to build an infrastructure of lime trees, um, more or less from scratch. It's a pretty sad story of how they had a big lime operation up until one of the embargoes, and then basically they cut it all down for firewood. Um, yeah, and I feel like um, one big part of that is that for the to be since it started out with smallholder farmers. And I'll start with the first question because then I can tie it in with lime after. The whole concept is, well, they do a lot of fruit tree planting as well. Um, and the whole idea is a lot of these trees kind of act like shade for the, for the fruit under it. So they kind of motivate farmers to both use trees to kind of create a better bi like eco climate on the earth itself and then supply the fruit in return for them planting. So it's kind of a balance. These farmers are a lot. I mean, they both sell papayas, and then they sell the other fruit. Like beans and that kind of thing. They have these seasonal But they plant crops. the trees to be able to grow the like ground fruit better. Yeah, I think that's it's interesting, because I wouldn't have answered it exactly like that, but that's a really good point. Like, in a sense, like the fruit trees are a huge part of what they get out of it, the shade enables these crops that would so you know, it's like uh yeah a balanced partnership but they also are very much there's a seed operation that's going on there it's not just like when you go to the nursery there's an aspect of both tending seedlings like trees but then also the disbursement in a way of uh of seed from these centers so like i i filmed one thing i don't know if it's in the film but when they're literally coming and they're getting their huge allotment of like bean seeds that have been gathered from the season before. Because you remember it's that kind of closed circle operation with high quality seed. And it's meant to really just deal with something that I, I wasn't really aware that farmers deal with, which is sort of low quality seed or seed that is designed not to reproduce in a way. Like it's one of the kind of nasty things about some of the big um, seed companies um, is that they sort of make, get you on the hook you know, plants can regenerate seeds, you know, like literally if you gather them and, and harvest them in a way, it's something that you can 
that you can build into a seed bank. And that's really what we saw getting into operation. And the small farmer, uh, a lot, like um, Hugh and Timote kind of also created this system where the seed that um, the crops are exchanged over the years so they don't have the same crop. Because before, I mean, in a large part of the small farmers, they just keep producing the same crop year after year and it kind of just the land that just ruins the soil after yeah. a while. So um, they buy like kind of the seed bank, they kind of also control the variety of seeds that are being planted so that the land stays yeah. fresh. It, they really did impart a lot of knowledge in the sense that they, when you see those fields, they, they don't look the same as the other fields you see in Haiti. Like they have these proprietaries, like you said, like sort of like scattered throughout. Anyway. But the interesting thing about the, the, the lime plantation is that they were starting with these small community-based, uh, like, um, you know, grassroots setups where farmers would come to the seed bank, but then would have their own land instead of this large cooperative land. So lime is like their first venture out in trying to hold on to this small boulder, like community-based farming and avoid the situation of an actual plantation. We actually don't like calling it a plantation at all because that usually means that once a farmer ends up on a plantation, they're not a farmer anymore. They're mm -hmm. just a worker on the plantation. So they do, um, in this lime situation, we created this cooperative so that every farmer has ownership over the plant itself. Yeah. Other Which questions? Important. Go ahead. Um, so just like, obviously, it seems like a super successful project, um, but the fact that um, the Clinton Foundation is involved is very, like, just naturally arises suspicion because of other things that has happened in Haiti with them, such as, like, um, Hillary's brother getting gold mine contracts there. And, you know, the fact remains that a lot of the money did go missing. So is the question would be, is there a mechanism in place to oversee or ensure that the export aspect of this, that it doesn't turn into yet another Clinton exploitative venture. Um, there actually is. Um, they're creating a whole new supply chain to actually make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, they definitely, with the Moringa and the Lime, they're setting up another consortium that will be the export consortium. So they have the cooperative, the farm, and the cooperative, the process. And then they created a new consortium of different cooperatives that take care of the processing and the export. So it'll all stay a community-based program. Like they're getting rid of the export middleman that a lot of these uh, yeah. big farming operations do by creating a consortium of different cooperatives working together to export. And I think the model that the Clinton Foundation has used with many of the projects in Haiti uh, is to find local partners that are building a model and to, in a sense, fund them. Um, you know, the, the Clinton Foundation doesn't have a huge on the ground staff in Haiti like uh, CARE International or one of the other big uh, NGOs. They sort of focus on capacity building through programs and that's inherently sort of hit or miss and maybe that's what you're referring to. Um, not every project is a success. Um, but, uh, you know, they are there, in a sense, um, evaluating grants, and they gave grants to this project. And that, in a sense, is what um, one aspect of their operation. The other thing is proximity. Um, you know, the, the foundation is sort of set up in a way that it is a network of people. Um, you have sort of like this long-term investment in Haiti by President Clinton, who was the UN envoy there post-earthquake. Uh, um, and, you know, that ends up yielding a lot of connections that can then be made. They end up being um, able to bring in resources, for example, uh, relationships like uh, you know, Whole Foods or something under that umbrella of the Clinton Foundation actually is advantageous. They have a t tradition of doing sort of um, nonprofit private sector partnerships. Um, whether it's bringing Coca-Cola there to do a mango factory, which ultimately didn't work out for a variety of reasons, including sort of like the husks of the mango um, weren't good for the machines, um, to an SFA, you know what I mean? So um, there's a lot of noise, political kind of 
partisan noise around the foundation, but the foundation itself is not um, set up that way. It's set up as a grant giving kind of network building um, uh, organization that works on capacity in Haiti. And it's, like I said, it's hit or miss, um, but it's not, I think, as pernicious as it's been described. And in this case, it's <laughs> What? Yeah, in this case, they right. brought Timlin together. Like they yeah, and they linked up Timlin to uh, Trees of the Future, and then later linked up Timlin. It was more of a facilitating back end situation than actually right. being involved. Right, like some of the others. Yeah, I think there's different levels of involvement. Yeah. If that answers. Yeah, the, the, especially the consortium. Yeah, I'm it's very. I, it's very interesting actually because if overall Haiti. Um, is kind of uh, in danger of being overtaken by these large plantations. Uh -huh. You know, definitely, you know, people who live in Dominican Republic and then just have some land in Haiti and then never actually end up being there. So I think it's very important that they're trying to create a supply chain model as well um, to not only create this small situation with planting trees and creating, you know, community based development but also trying to find a way for haiti itself as a country to have a but that's when you workplace. that's when you end up getting involved in you know exportation has to do with government you yeah. know setting up you know big factories has to do with government and the government in haiti is deeply broken you know they lost like um was it 40 percent or more of their civil service in the earthquake you know like they literally it was flattened also a, a overthrow Democratic. At, yeah, in general, in general, the top is in general broken. In the whole political system no in one, Haiti is continually broke. Yeah, and, and you and can't really count you, on you any can, kind of. You can try system. and empower people who are able to, I think, make certain you know steps, but there's just endemic corruption in the system, and it's very hard to scale solutions in a country that doesn't have. A, a properly operational political system. It's just really hard. There's too much corruption. And so I think you have a natural ceiling that you will tend to hit as you try and big, build scalable big operations in Haiti. Um, and that's, that's just better. that's just what, you know, you have to be very deft it's about challenge. sort of operating. And you see, you know, we saw some of that. There's a conversation in the film where Hugh and Timote are in a car and they're driving and they're sort of talking about finding what you need as partners. Remember, it's been ed it's been edited to a point where it's, so it's like not going to stab anybody in the eye. But like there's like, you know, there's some stuff where they're literally talking about like you need the right partners on the ground. And that's like a really veiled way of saying you need people who aren't going to ask you to line their pockets. Like, you know, it's like very, it was very clear you need people who are, you know, that will work with you. And don't want to just get some. And that means a lot more than it's a low, very loaded sort of term. Other questions? Right there. So if you could speak to sort of the all of the different parts of the design for sort of the transitional period as you guys like self sustaining um how like the transition talk to that and I know I was really intrigued by the fact that a lot of the the work was sustained through the top two partners and sort of how it's been. Well, that was sort of like the whole key to it was that it wasn't a cash for work program and it wasn't, um, you know, heavy aid based. It was more about, um, you know, establishing this cooperative system that then could be self-sustaining. You know, Hugh is down there, was down there last week. Um, so Hugh and Timote are continually involved there. Um, I think the, the notion that there would be no more SFA, that's not the point. Like the point is that the Timberlands investment Ca you know, cash investment and sustaining them is gone away. But the part of it was setting up these new markets, like the the Moringa exportation market, and um, yeah. And then part of it is also handing off a lot of the um, sort of paid agronomist role. This is something we were just talking about, but sort of like the paid ag agronomist role, passing that wisdom on to the kind of the cooperatives themselves, so that they have, you know, the knowledge of of uh, agron that these agronomists had. Um, continuing with the, with their crops, so and, and they're actually now. I mean, just after uh, we finished maybe the film, um, they were trans they were um, transferring the original communities, the one in Goni Eve that we started out with the film to uh, community ownership, so that 
because what happens is Timote comes in, they have these meetings, and they help, but they bring an agronomist in to give trainings. And after, now, while we were editing that film, they were giving leadership training to people within the community to then keep going. And I think now Goni is pretty much running on yeah. its own. I'm going to see you next week, and I'll get an update. And, so um, they're kind of at the end of the seed money now, giving all these communities <clears throat> the opportunity to show. Um, you back there? Um, you focus on the rain. Yeah. Can you talk about or what the other initiatives and also yeah. Be sure to oh yeah, sorry. So we did focus on um, Gonaive and then um, San Michel de, de Latte. Yeah. Um, was their expansion? But it's um, mainly Central Plateau. It's mainly Central Plateau. So that gets to the kind of scalability question and how um, SFA sort of is able to um, plant their model in different in different parts of the country. Um, they like flying a little bit under the radar, I think, because it sort of enables, I mean, Hugh is a very vocal person, and, and Timote is certainly well known, but I think the fact that they're not in, um, you know, they're not um, huge enables them to do a lot of the work that they do. Um, they also look for communities that haven't had sort of like the traditional patronage model of, of um, intervention or care, and, um, so there's a lot of places that they'll go to where there's sort of an expectation of um, sort of patronage money in some, some form, and that just can't, they can't work in those places. Um, I know they're always looking to expand, and I think they really would, you know, it's a, it, is a, it is a challenge to raise, you know, new investment and that kind of thing to set the model up. The point is that SFA, like, needs start, like, seed money to get going, like, in communities. So it's not so simple as just like once they've done a successful model in one place, now they can just pick up and go somewhere else. They actually do need partners that, that enable to expand them. Um, and that's why like, you know, they, they continue to get support from, while not Timberland right now, they're getting still um, funding from like the Clinton Foundation for some of the new studies that they're doing on sustainable cotton. They're looking into bringing cotton planting back into Haiti and if there's a way to do that. Um, and also some of the, pro the processing stuff. They're looking at new grants for being able to build up this like, sort of supply chain. So thank you for letting me know. I came out a little bit late, so it's possible that you addressed um, my questions earlier. So I have two relatively separate ones. Um, and the first one has to do um, with the tree that was seen as um, the moringa tree. I'm curious to know um, its origins and uh, if its origins are outside of Haiti, why uh, choose to go with a uh, plant um, that was not indigenous to the region. Um, and second, um, I'm curious to know as filmmakers, you're able to address um, uh, problems that are more systemic in nature. So um, I'm thinking of two ways. So on the one hand, uh, looking at the links between deforestation and reforestation more um, fully. Right? So the sense in which um, those forests were put down for energy because the infrastructure in Haiti is so underdeveloped that um, wood is primary mode of uh, energy. Um, and so what that then means for, um, like how does, right, so, so given the lack of infrastructural development, how do you deal with that even in the context of delivering, you know, fresh limes to market if there isn't a well-developed uh, road system? Um, and then secondly, thinking of it in terms of colonization uh, and the very deep history of Haiti and knowing that um, the Haitian Revolution, for example, was one of the, it's more progressive than even the French Revolution, um, but this has been written out and utterly silenced in our understanding and contributions of um, Haiti in our own every day. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear how you address those systemic concerns um, in filmmaking. Okay. Sure. I'll try and repeat also. Should I quickly do the Moringa one? Yeah, but you have to repeat the question. All right, so the question was, 
um, that moringa, or whether moringa is a native tree to Haiti or not, and what are the advantages of if it's not native, which it isn't, um, to grow it in Haiti, bring something out into the country. Um, I think moringa. Um, it has a very, it grows really quickly and it provides a lot of different nutrients, but also provides, um, you can also cut it down and use it as far as it grows out when it grows within 90 days. So overall, and it can grow everywhere. And since Haiti is already so deforested, it's just really hard to get trees to even grow there in the first place. Um, yeah, and Moringa is a, rain, like, yeah it, it's just either really dry or, for, or the soil is just not doesn't have any nutrients in it anymore and Moringa grows on pretty much everything and then provides the soil with nutrients so you can start out a field that is now unusable and grow mm -hmm. Moringa on it and then within a couple of seasons you can start growing other stuff on it because Moringa kind of started feeding the soil um, so it's actually just a very uh, useful tree and it's cheap. And it's from the Indian subcontinent, to answer your question. It's originally, but it's, it grows in equatorial regions. It's like it's happy in, in warm climates. Um, and your other question was uh, about the Haitian Revolution, uh, the larger context in of, of the culture there. Um, and I, you know, we, you know, we didn't explore a lot like um, the history of how things got broken in Haiti. Um, we are, you know, we were familiar with the fact that, you know, we were speaking about it just earlier, you know, the fact that Haiti was really punished for its revolution um, and forced to pay and had to make a lot of like choices about sort of its own um, property, uh, it, you know, that yielded all these results like deforestation. Um, you know, and it's also had, you know, terrible governance for, for a long time where there was uh, dictatorships that, you know, really exploited certain um, aspects of the country. Um, you know, the other point that you made um, about charcoal and energy and infrastructure, you know, Haiti is doing a lot to try and build its infrastructure. You're it's seeing doing a lot that, better. Yeah, actually, yeah you're seeing. The past couple of years. You're seeing like the, the like when I first started going to Haiti, like there was the road between Port-au-Prince and Gonaïve was rutted and broken and um, took hours and hours. And I really, when I say rutted, like you know, like you needed like a four-wheel drive vehicle kind of thing. Like it's like you know, big holes, like lots of lots of problems, and then. They redid the whole state road there, and now there's a two-lane blacktop that connects Gonaïve, which is you know basically three hours north of Port-au-Prince or whatever up the up the coast from Port-au-Prince um, into the city. So there's there's there is signs of of change, and there's markets along those roads all along. Like Haiti has a lot of informal markets. Like basically the way. Um, many people make a subsistence living is that they are set up along the roads selling specific types of products. They're the people that sell your toiletries, they're the people that sell um, your your toys, they're the people that do your technology stuff, they're the people that send your faxes. Like, you know, there's like a whole, like, just constant repeating set of um, services being provided by individuals. And of course, that also breaks down as the, there's the people who sell you your bread versus the people who sell you your fruit versus the people who sell you your veg. You know, it's like, it is, it you know, quite clear like that um, the the sales infrastructure that you have in the United States where it's like big supermarkets and that kind of thing does not exist you know like it just doesn't exist so you have a lot of informal markets and that's good that's good because it sort of spreads the wealth around but it also like creates a situation where those people are basically getting I think loaned a lot of that stuff you know so it's like a you know you have to they have to pay back somebody who they sell it to um, and then as far as just charcoal, I mean, like, yeah, it, it's a it's a painful thing to see, like, um, all the charcoal for sale on the side of the road, knowing that there's so few trees left on the hills. However, what's really interesting about it is, like, when Hugh and Timote chose the trees for the SFA folks to plant, they chose very deliberately, and they spoke to the farmers about what their needs were. So there were a lot of fruit trees, you know, because people love to have fresh fruit and to, have, to sell it at the market. But beyond that, they they also planted trees that were good for living fences, you know, so that people wouldn't have to 
build fences, they could literally have these living fences, including Moringa. And then um, there are trees that shed a lot of branches that can be used for charcoal. So they have literally thought ahead as to sort of like what the needs might be vis-a-vis -vis, um, charcoal in that community. Now, I don't think they're giving people um, uh, the choice of like becoming like charcoal producers. You know what I mean? Like they're not like handing out um, trees in order that they be burned down. You saw that the woman at the end of the uh, of the film is very, very protective of the trees that they have. Um, and there are many trees that the, those first trees that were planted on the hillside were designed to be canopy trees. Because as Leah said, the microclimates have become so inhospitable to trees in Haiti that unless you start with a kind of a canopy tree that then creates a kind of shade and coolness, you won't have stuff that grows up. If you have a bunch of trees that just go, you know, straight up and they don't create that, you 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 end up not having the fundamentals that you need to really recreate a forest. So they're being smart about it. Like you know, he, Timothy's, they understand the need also. I they're mean, respectful of people's needs, and they're they're also knowledgeable about what it's going to take. I think to to do that, you know, kind of local reforestation. Just to piggyback on that as well, um, when you're when you're capable of increasing agricultural production, um, there are such efforts such as creating green charcoal, um, making making charcoal alternatives out of uh, agricultural waste products. Um, <coughs> perhaps not necessarily in the, in the case of key limes, but I imagine when cotton comes into play, I know they do it with uh, sugarcane, with the byproduct of sugarcane distillation um, that can decarbonize into a substance known as biochar that can be used as an energy alternative. Also as a soil emission, so there's a lot of tinkering at that going on as well. Really, what, what's what's applaudable in all of this context is that um, there are efforts on the ground that are looking to actually not just put a band-aid on Haiti overall, but to look at the actual um, causes that have impoverished the country, that have, have kept people poor, that have eroded the soil and contributed to all the environmental uh, disasters that we're now seeing. I have a question also, yeah. too, and we talked about scalability, you spoke about scalability, and of course it takes time to activate a new community. My question is, I know on the website of the film, I'm looking for people to help host screenings. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if it's possible that that happens at least in the local distribution, the local screenings in Haiti, with farming communities in other parts of the world. Yeah, I mean, so... Your question is about distribution and, and of helping of helping other farmers and community organizations um, learning from this model by means of having a workshop, um, inviting local agronomists, agronomy students um, in various parts of the country, and showcasing that film, for instance, and in, in sparking a conversation about it. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the film, the whole purpose of the film was to demonstrate the model, sort of like both. We had early on sort of shown. You know the um, the way it evolved with with our work with Timberland was that we initially were doing short form content that was showing the initial steps of the program and then later the first successes of the program, sort of like you know in 2012 when the crop yields had already gone up and that kind of thing, and then ultimately we filmed that last year very intensively, sort of to see um, in a verite style whether things were going to. Kind of emerge like sustainably whether there was going to be the possibility of reaching these international markets um what the lime plantation was going to get going that kind of the, the lime a cooperative was going to get going and that kind of thing the the this screening for example is part of an effort to show the film around the united states we really like to spread there's a company called film sprout that's working with timberland that is very good at sort of has a network of community organizations, the sustainability folks, um, environmental people who, who would be inclined to present a film like this in order that that kind of conversation that you're suggesting gets started. In Haiti itself, there has been there have been a couple of screenings that Hugh has spearheaded. Um, it's a really interesting notion. It's something that I'll, I'll sort of talk to Margaret and to Timberland about. Like what, you know, one of the issues I think with um, you know, that notion of sort of starting conversations and that kind of thing in country is just making sure that you have some capacity to follow through. Um, you know, you don't, I don't think want to start false expectations or anything like that. You want, I mean, in, in a way, I think what, what if Timberland would love to see is other companies, other organizations, nonprofits, um, adapting or adopting in a sense, this model that they've worked on, which is like, uh, 
working with the community, establishing cooperatives, and building out both better crop yields for smallholder farmers and you know tree planting um, for deforested places. That is something that I think could be applied globally. It, could, it doesn't need, necessarily need to be in Haiti, um, and Timberland doesn't necessarily need to be this, the, the the organization that's seeding it. You're seeing a lot more conversation just generally about smallholder farmers, and there's really like there's really a little bit of a rub there between you know places like I got recently to go to, to Zambia about a year ago to Zambia and like there the Chinese are buying up a lot of the land um, and creating essentially big plantations you know big um, um, operations instead of like this other model that you're seeing support for in this film um, where it's working with local people and trying to get them to stay rooted on the land and improve their crop yields on their existing property. And if you heard Hugh on this, it's incredible. Like what the statistics that you hear about, like how many smaller farmers around the world, the, the lack of arable land that we have left for planting, the fact that the, if you really want to, you know, reach, you know, nine billion, you don't want to reach, but if we are going to reach nine billion people on this on this earth without a, adding a lot of arable land, we need to improve crop yields for smallholder farmers. So the real focus is, I think, on leveraging that model globally, and like, really, can we do more? Um, my question, I used to be a general specialist at poultry, so I was working with like, um, I worked with like two broad organic uh, juice companies here. And just like, I know you guys just, you know, the company's launching in Whole Foods, so how do you, I guess, inform the customer about, you know, how is the farm, like, how are the farming methodologies different than with this, with these brands and me? versus other brands and like how do you kind of make it short and sweet so that they yeah. can understand it because like when you're explaining it i didn't fully like understand all of it from the beginning even though it's like amazing and um i've seen like i mean there's so many things coming up right now so many brands coming up and they all have like an amazing story mm -hmm. but it's hard to separate um, it out. Yeah, I'm trying to like <laughs> trying to consolidate my question. It's not so much of a question, but rather like how do you make uh you know make make it unique, but really like explain like why it's different and like why it's important for people to support this versus just you know, oh it's organic, it's fair trade. I'm good. I'm going to just get this off the shelf. Well, I think in the situation with Cooley Cooley, um, which is already kind of uh, a company focused on um, the narrative of where something comes from and um, sharing the story of how a product got to the shelf. So I think um, the Small Farmers Alliance definitely made a specific decision to partner with them because they're already focused on that kind of narrative in uh, their product. and. Uh, in developing and working with Cooley Cooley, um, they decided also to create one new product that is just represented by the small farmer. I think the marketing aspect of this is that this is unique from Haiti by the smallholder farmers alike, like by the smallholder farmers. And I think uh, a big part of that is just kind of knowing the journey this product made to the market. Um, and I think they're focusing very much on straight from the ground of the smallholder farmers to the processing plant that was run by these uh, women cooperatives to um, the actual like export of it, that that line is just very clear. And I think that's what they focused on. To, so not necessarily the model that's behind it that created that, it all, that would be the second level. But, but that's cool and cool marketing too, like Timberland, yeah like supported Smallholder yeah, Farmers Alliance and the Smallholder Farmers Alliance through that scene that you saw where everybody gets connected at the Clinton Foundation, basically that's where Timberland steps back at that point. Yeah. They're not doing the marketing. Like once the, the net, you know, once the connection has been made and it's like actually established it, that marketing is on Cooley Cooley. So check out their website and see what they're doing. Um, I don't know, like when you go to Whole Foods right now, in the energy shot, shot section, that's where you'll find Cooley Cooley stuff. And it's not like heavily advertised. You have to read this little bottle and sort of see. It's, you know, it's like it's there with all the other energy shots. It's I hard mean, to separate these things out. I, mean, I really do think just being on the ground and like being around the city and you know, talking to people 
Yeah. Yeah. And like it is important to have someone representing. No, I think that personal narrative you know, is just key. Yeah. Because some people like are inter. I mean, I'll just be honest. Like I thought everyone would be super interested in the story, and some people just aren't. They're just like, oh, is this good for me? Like, how is it going to benefit me? But that's it. It's like, you don't know what marketing is going to work for which audience, right? Some people want that narrative. Other people just want to know that it's high in protein. Yeah. That they're going to get super fit. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Different priorities. Go ahead. So um, if just I'm understanding this correctly, it's like uh, Timberland seeded this project. Yeah. And they're very... um, company as I know I know they really try to their products embody uh, sustainable um, characteristics um, and in addition to that it looks like they're so they're taking smaller margins to begin with to, to provide a higher quality product and then with their profits they're uh, investing in initiatives such as this and that adds that reinforces who they are as a company and it also provides them with value because it gives them a story to engage yeah. their consumers in further into the story of sustainability. So I can see the value that it's providing them immediately. And then the long-term hope for value is if it scales up, then they can go and start sourcing product for their own, um, uh, they can go start product sourcing, uh, you know, um, yeah, materials for their own product eventually. Um, so that's a long-term value that's also uh, providing them because they're a uh, fashion company and they're um, investing in food and a food product and then you also have the collaboration of now is that Cooley Cooley is a brand already and yeah. this is a new product that they're going to be offering yeah. on the market. It is offered this is now. separate uh, from, I mean they're, they're uh, Cooley Cooley just signed an agreement with smaller farmers and Timberland was there to slightly facilitate but yeah. after that they you know, I mean, so it's your your basic question is around Timberland's motivation and like how how it works. And I think that basically, when we first started working with Timberland, we'd done a lot of climate change work with them already in two thousand and nine, and then um, they had been setting up this tree planting operation in Haiti. And at the time, um, they were a privately owned company, um, and their CEO was a, a real visionary. This guy called Jeff Swartz. And Margaret was, you know, is the through line through all these years. So she was there and she was the head of what was called values marketing. She's now a global brand manager. The company was sold in something like 2011 or something to VF. VF owns many different fashion brands, North Face, Wrangler, Splendid Mills. Some of them are sustainable. Some of them are less, you know, like it's like it's a big company based out of North Carolina that's publicly traded. And it was a something that Margaret really pushed for to, you know, keep this going and to fuse the sort of sustainable DNA of Timberland into VF. And VF, I think, was interested, although not completely committed at the beginning, and then has ultimately continued to support what they were doing. And I think, like, yeah, the notion of, like, sustainability within a company. I mean, a company makes products. Some people would argue, I think, you know, that any kind of consumerism is sort of not sustainable. But you have a spectrum of viewpoints on that. And Timberland uh, is certainly in the mindset of trying to um, build sustainability and protect nature and find better ways of making things. Like, they work on many different components. Like, they have this thing with green rubber that they did for a while where they wanted to like, now they have a a, a tire deal with a big tire manufacturer to recycle tires for soles of their shoes. Now they're also helping to do um, something with with cotton. They're they're helping to fund a study on sustainable cotton and what's possible there. They're focused on the supply chain. How can they make the boxes that they ship their shoes in you know, less impactful and more recycled. Like there's a, just a, a deep sort of focus on, on trying to minimize impact. Um, and then I think on the flip side, there is this commitment to looking for new supply chains. And even though there is a um, food focus with SFA, it's, you know, they're looking at cotton now, which is part of a, a big, big part of their footprint on the world is cotton which is a very hard crop to grow in a way that is um, good for the environment. And, you know, in a sense, um, that's 
part of the process here. It's it is long term. You think most companies are focused like very you know short term profits and that kind of thing, and I think they have a long term commitment to this you know notions of sustainability and how they can minimize their impact. And so, SFA and all the work we did in Haiti, hopefully, is just the kind of like a part of a, a process that is going to be growing through the years. You know that there will be new projects, new ways of doing this, new ways of leveraging that story. Um, to see other people taking on similar challenges and working with communities to do that. I hope so. I think it's, it's, it's cool. And that's what she said in the end that um, she was really hoping that to get the word out, like to spread, uh, be a steward is the beginning of it, and then spreading the word so that they can increase that model in different types of um, supply. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they, they spent these five years that we, you know, that we followed them in Haiti also trying to establish and, and, and develop the model over time. So I think they also just want to share what they've learned. And I mean, a big part of the film is too, is like what they've learned over time and how this model can work in different situations. And I think that's a big part of it. Yes. We have about like four minutes left, so maybe time for one more question. Anyone? Anyone? But from uh, from the inception of this uh, movie, uh, the plan was to uh, to plant about five million trees. Was it the idea of what kind of trees, species, or was it the business plan to plant the moringa trees? It was, I, I mean, the origin of the idea of five million trees in five years was the commitment that Jeff Schwartz made at um, CGR. CGI, um, but I think, as I said, with learning, um, it was just trees. But they first were based, focused a lot more on trees that would create shade, that would kind of develop the soil, and then more like moringa was added to it, kind of grew into this variety yeah. of trees. I think if we made a longer movie, we might have gone into the failures of other tree planting operations and why they failed, and one of them has to do with decisions like really you know unitary decisions to plant a certain type of tree because it's the cheapest yeah, tree or they were the also there know, to like, find out what yeah, kind of they, tree the people wanted i mean that's, that's the main the, question that's the kind of revolutionary aspect of, of the model it's just like go listen to the people what kind of trees would be helpful for them oh they need a little bit of charcoal they need something that will also yield fruit they need you know something to be a living fence and at the same time there's this hillside that's a community hillside that they should be reforested and they've got like a variety of species of trees that they're that they're planting. Like when you see those um, the the shots in the nursery, you can see the variety of seedlings that they have. I right? Think they're doing like six to ten. Maybe? Yeah. So as of now, the statistics show it's about four million and something planted. Yeah. Are there any metrics? What type of trees? What species of trees? The breakdown of the trees? I don't know exactly. Uh, I can ask I'm you. sure there are metrics on the breakdown of trees of the small holder farmer alliance itself. So I don't know how far they track. Yeah, rough per or their, percentages. The, of what the, they how many trees of this and this? But I'm sure there is probably some kind of metric on the division of what kind of trees, yeah. certain percentage wise. But and, I, and they have a website that you guys can all look at. The small holders. See their website, which has details about trees and yeah, farmers. Yeah, SFA has a website, and Combi Film is the website for the film itself, CombiFilm.com. And yeah, I mean, I think it's it, there's also probably some resources like um, that you could that would be interesting for you to, to sort of dig in on moringa and everything. You know, there's there's different resources there. <laughs> Well, thank you All so right. much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.